Good morning, folks, and welcome to a very special episode of the IBM Kiskit Quantum Seminar dedicated to you, the research and academic quantum communities. Now, in just a minute here, it will be my absolute pl pleasure to roll out this week's episode with Professor Emmanuel Bloch from IBM Quantum. And yes, that's Bloch like the Bloch Sphere. So before we get there, I'm very glad you joined us on time because we have a tradition to ask you and start with where you are tuning in from today. So here I find myself in New York City. You can reply to this in the comment chat box located somewhere on YouTube, above, below, left or right. And that's the same place where you can discuss live with myself and Emmanuel and ask questions. And we'll try to have a lively interactive discussion. You can discuss amongst yourself and we'll also bring these up to Emmanuel and uh, try to keep this as interactive as possible. Now, today is a very special day because of several reasons. One, this is episode 148 since we started in March of 2023. And we are marking the end of 2023. Uh, so this will be the final episode for this year, but we'll be back for almost our three years, uh, three year anniversary, which will come in the beginning of the year. You remember that our at our 100th seminar, we had uh, a little celebration. We had over 130 years of watch time on the seminar, uh, more than half a million views. And I'm happy to report to you and Paul, our producer here, who's been with us for, since the beginning, has informed me that we've now just crossed the 1 million view mark on the seminar. So what a great way to end the year to keep us all connected. Uh, and so we had a very short little rhyme. In the quantum realm, we delve and explore IBM Kiskit through the quantum door. Since March 23, our journey's been vast. 140 episodes, each one a blast. A million views, a milestone so bright, shining like stars in the quantum night. So I hope you enjoy this series. I hope you come back uh, next year just as fresh and refreshed. Um, and with that, I will remind you that this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time right here on the Kiskid YouTube channel. So you can always go back and rewatch these and catch up on anything you missed. And by staying subscribed, you will know what's coming up. But you can only ask questions live at noon Eastern time. So folks, I think it's time we get started. I have the absolute pleasure to first of all welcome all of you from, from India, Denmark, Germany, Yokohama, Poland, New York, uh, I see congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Netherlands, Turkey, etc. But very special guest for the end of the year. Here we have uh, with us Professor Emmanuel Bloch from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and LMU. And hello, Emmanuel. It's a pleasure to see you today. Thanks a lot, Slavko. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and a big welcome also to everybody from my side. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just highlight how we got to the seminar, which is that you were giving these incredible lectures at the Boulder Summer School of Condensed Matter Physics in Denver, uh, where where I got the chance to uh, you know have lunch with you and meet you and, and have the pleasure to invite you. Uh, and as we'll see, this will be very fruitful. Uh, before we get to this, allow me to briefly introduce you to our audience here, though you need no introduction. Uh, Emmanuel is scientific director at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and holds a chair for experimental physics at the Ludwig Maximilians University, LMU of Munich. Uh, Emmanuel's scientific work is among the most frequently cited in the field of quantum physics, so there's no question that you have crossed the paper of Emmanuel's and has helped to open many new research fields. For his research, uh, Emmanuel has received many, many international awards. I cannot possibly name all of them, but I'll name the Cooper uh, European Science Prize, the Harvey Prize, the Zeiss Research Award, and in 2022 was named the Clairvariate Citation Laureate for his uh, really pioneering work on quantum simulations. So with that, uh, Emmanuel, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Slatko, for the kind introduction and the pleasure to be here today with you. Uh, as one of the last, as the last speaker of the year. And so I hope I'll make it entertaining and informative for you. It's a little bit different topic to what you've been hearing so far, but uh, I think, you know, diversity is a good thing in this. So uh, let me start off by, I think, what excites us, or a lot of us most, of having these fantastic quantum devices, computers, simulators, 
at hand now that I think we really have a unique opportunity to study quantum antibody systems with completely new uh, light and a completely new light. Uh, understand them much better, hopefully, of course, make progress in designing new materials, new, new chemical um, and molecules. Uh, but, you know, as a fundamental scientist, as I am myself doing fundamental research, this is really a really unique time to explore these systems with unique views on them. And there are basically two ways how to do that the simulation and computation approach that I want to compare first of all. So I want to you know, introduce this idea of quantum simulation, how it differs a little bit from uh, computation and give you a few examples of where we apply these things and give you an outlook in the end on, on where we might be going with this platform in, in, in the future. So when we talk about you know, simulation and computing, we, we think of these typically, most people would, uh, I think, draw the separation in the following way, that in some way we're trying to calculate uh, for a certain Hamiltonian, which describes the rule set of our system, how, let's say, electrons in a solid behave, and we want to calculate their dynamics or their ground states. And in an analog way, we can do that by directly implementing the Hamiltonian in our system and uh, studying the behavior of the particles in the system and having, for example, a continuous time evolution of the system, then directly evolving according to the rules that we program into the system directly. So this is a very powerful uh, approach because it makes very good use of the resources that you have. But uh, the downside of this is that it's a non-universal approach that basically you can only study what you can actually implement in the lab and you don't have universality of the models that you want to study. Then, of course, we have the gate-based approach that you're probably all very familiar with, that we basically try to break down these model Hamiltonians into discrete gate sets, two qubit gates, single qubit gates, into a universal set of few gates, and that allow us to basically then come up with modeling this entire model Hamiltonian, for example, by trotterizing some time evolution in the system, and the great thing with this is, of course, that it's universal. So basically, you can um, model any Hamiltonian you can write down. But in a downside, it's very resource hungry. So how much you can do with this approach, of course, depends on the resources you have available. So you know which one wins out, I think, depends a little bit on the question you're asking. I think right now, of course, we also have to say that both approaches are pursued basically across all platforms. Now, one comment I just want to make that often when quantum simulation, people think, well, uh, there is this really a stable approach uh, if you have errors in the system or slight calibration errors uh, doesn't that lead to catastrophic failure and I just want to point out this very nice paper from my colleague Ignacio Sirac with Raul Trivedi where they actually looked at this question and asked you know can you how stable are quantum simulators and asked and answered that affirmative that even though you can have an extensive set of errors in the system typically the quantities we look at in quantum simulations and we'll get to examples in a second are intensive quantities which uh, basically are very robust to possible, let's say, calibration errors that you can have in the system. And if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend this paper from Ignacio and Raul to you, where they uh, lay this out in mathematical detail. Now, often also, maybe I want to, one thing I like to bring up also that, you know, analog sometimes we think is old fashioned and digital is the way to go. Uh, I think we're even in, you know, modern electronics learning that, you know, for specialized applications, analog can be a very powerful way to go. Uh, and you can outperform digital electronics. For example, there's these specialized chips that you can see here, even for machine learning, where it turns out that going to analog ways of processing information can hold certain advantages. So the whole field kind of, I think, started or goes back to this, at least, you know, when I started entering this field to this very pioneering work of uh, Ignacio and uh, Zirak and Peter Zoller, where they were one of the first ones to propose to show how you could, you know, by loading uh, ultra cold atoms and lattices simulate a completely different field of physics the one of strongly correlated electrons and materials uh, uh, through this quantum simulation approach and you know for me this was you know i read this paper and i was really captivated by this and i thought we have to try this and then you know 2002 we, we did the first experiment on that where we really saw this phase transition that they had predicted and we could show that indeed you can simulate the physics of strongly correlated materials with, with artificial quantum systems. And by now, I think it's become one of the major application areas across all platforms. You know, quantum simulations, 
even if you do them in your digital non-error corrected mode uh, and you know that has become i think one of the main applications of whole field of quantum computers of quantum simulators of what we try to look at across all platforms so i think that's i think one thing we recognize today that it's a very exciting time to study these systems to probe these many body systems all right, so let me tell you a little bit more about our system. So uh, our systems are uh, atoms, neutral atoms that we trap in uh, optical traps. In our case, we use uh, so-called optical lattices, which you create by interfering several laser beams. And here I have a beautiful picture from uh, my colleague, Nobel Prize winner Ted Hensch here in Munich, where he basically took five laser beams uh, sent them in under specific angles. And what you're seeing here on the screen is actually the interference pattern of these five laser beams, which in this case uh, gave rise because of the arrangement of the beams to this quasi-crystal uh, structure of light. Now this light field, when we have atoms, we can trap atoms in these light fields. And this is what you've heard probably from the optical tweezers maybe already, uh, but these atoms experience a trapping potential purely uh, uh, through the light field that they're exposed to. So if we create this crystalline structure out of light for our atoms, it's like a you know crystal of light in which they behave. So this is how we synthesize uh, the, the, let's say, periodic structure in which we want to trap our atoms. Now for the atoms, you know, there are several possibilities. The nice thing, of course, there are, uh, for atoms, there are fermions, there are bosons, or we can load mixtures of those into the system. Uh, we can deal with spins in the system, so we can, of course, also have qubits, which could be two hyperfine states or two elect other electronic states that we have in the qubit in the in the system. And we can either lock the particles into this lattice, so they're really static; they don't move. They're more like qubits, or we can have them also let them roam around, tunnel from lattice side to lattice side, and then we're really emulating directly the behavior, for example, of electrons inside inside a material. And then it's of course great to be able to do this directly with fermions. And this is a big advantage because you don't need to map now your fermionic problem to a qubit system. You don't have this overhead anymore. And we typically do this with a few thousands of particles, uh, as I said, either in the itinerant or static regime. And we do this in order actually to de bring the atoms, to have the atoms trapped in lattices, we actually have to make them pretty cold. So they are just held by the light fields in your vacuum chamber. So actually we have to cool our atoms to these nano Kelvin temperatures. All right, so let me give you a few uh, energy scales and give you a few ideas of what these lattices look like. So the lattices, as we said, are created by interfering a laser beam. So if you take two laser beams and have them counter propagate, then you get uh, just a strike pattern, an optical standing wave. Uh, the periodicity will be typically lambda over two. You can load atoms into one of those lattice sites and then atoms can tunnel from one side to the next. The tunnel couplings are typically given here, 100 hertz to five kilohertz. And if you go to a single site, it's basically like a harmonic oscillator with harmonic oscillator frequencies around 10 kilohertz to one megahertz with ground state extensions, 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. Now, uh, we said before, you know, what kind of lattice you synthesize through interference depends on the angles you send the beams in. And, and, you know, typically we thought if we want to change lattice geometry, then we always have to completely shine the lasers under different angles. And while it's easy for a supervisor to say that, you know, the students are not so happy if you tell them you want now a different lattice geometry, you want to align the whole system again for, you know, several months. So we had to come up with a better idea. And uh, just very recently, we came up with this idea how we could realize all these important lattice geometries that you can see here, the square lattice, hexagonal lattice, triangular lattices, Kagome lattices, or so-called deep lattices in one experimental setup. So we can really just at the tune of a knob change configuration between these different lattice structures that we have here. And keep in mind that, you know, for example, the depth or dimensionality of these lattices is entirely controlled from the outside world through the intensity at which we control uh, the laser light field. So by changing the, the intensity of the light field, we can make the lattice structure deeper. By dynamically tuning it down, we can make the lattice structure shallower. Now, of course, we want to have these things interact. We want to have uh, study the physics of interacting particles or make gates, maybe. Then we have several uh, things at our hand in the neutral atom community. One possibility is to bring atoms very close so they undergo a collisional interaction. Or you are dealing with uh, magnetic dipoles, so the atoms are like small magnets. Or you're dealing with uh, molecules, which can have an electric dipole. Then you have a dipole-dipole interaction. Or you're dealing with these Rydberg atoms where you excite an atom to a 
highly excited state where it can then interact with another Rydberg atom and have interaction energies up to you know the, the gigahertz scale. Or you can put these atoms in cavities and then have you know the atoms talk to each other by the light that's propagating in this cavity, uh, talking to these individual atoms in the cavities. So these are different options. We're mostly going to explore the, the collisional interaction today in my talk. So one big goal, what we want to do is, you know, in studying strongly correlated materials, which was from the beginning, you know, the, the, one of the main, main drivers to, to use this, is that we really want to look into these materials and basically study the dance of electrons inside the material. So we want to be able to take photos of these electrons, in our case, the atoms inside the material and study the correlations, the entanglement, uh, when we prepare them in a Hamiltonian uh, corresponding to a strongly correlated uh, electronic material. And the way to observe the atoms, uh, a tool has been this uh, fantastic technique of a quantum gas microscopy, which was developed by, by my colleague Markus Kreiner in Harvard and our group here in Munich, that allowed us uh, in, in 2010 to take pictures of these atoms that are stored in this lattice in, let's say, a single plane, a single 2D plane, and by shining light onto the atoms, you basically then detect them, you make them fluoresce, and with this good microscope objective, then you can resolve the position of each individual atom in the lattice. And here's a picture, uh, actually, of one of my uh, former postdocs, uh, Jeon Choi in Korea, uh, that he took, you know, showing you a picture of thousands of, you know, of atoms that are in such a lattice where you can detect individual atoms with very, very high uh, signal to noise quality. You can tell whether there's an atom on the lattice site or not. In this case, obviously, it's a square lattice uh, configuration that you're seeing. So you have this wonderful way of making the atoms in the lattice. You can detect them. You can also, by shining additional light fields around them, you can make Spock's potential. You can make different lattice geometries or, for example, something that's been studied very successfully by my colleague Tillman Esslinger in Zurich. If you make, for example, a reservoir box here and another box here, and you load the atoms into this first box, and you connect these two boxes by just a wire of light, you can study how they basically flow through this one box to the next box, and you can study transport through this wire of light, emulating a real, let's say, wire, one-dimensional wire, where electrons would flow through. Um, and then we can shine in, uh, you know, uh, laser light onto individual atoms to manipulate their spin state or move them around, for example. This is a bit harder for us in the lattices uh, and in, for example, the tweezer platform, simply because the spacings in our case are typically an order of magnitude closer, shorter than the spacings you have uh, between optical tweezers. There it's around five micrometer. For us, it's around half a micron. Uh, because we do need that, we want the atoms to move eventually, so we do want this uh, close distance between the atoms. All right, then just a final technique, uh, when you're dealing with electrons, it's not enough to just say, you know, is, it a, is there an electron or not? Or for us, the atoms that mimic these electrons, the two, two spin states uh, for the atoms that mimic the two uh, electronic spin states uh, in the material, we really want to know, uh, is there a spin up? Uh, on a side, a spin down on a side, are there spin up and downs on a side or an empty side? So we have four configurations that we have to deal with that we want to detect. And the way we do this is we start with the physical system. Let's say this is this 2D system with the given lattice structure that you want. And then for detection, just for detection, we actually basically separate the spin ups from the spin down into two layers. Uh, we call this the spin splitting, like a stern gerlach experiment. And then you just image the two layers, one occupied by the spin ups and one by the spin downs. But remember, they were together in the physical system here in this monolayer. So you can put this together, this information, and then completely reconstruct the occupation of your lattices where the spin ups were, the spin downs were, the double ons, the doubly occupied sites, or the, the holes were in the system. And so if you think about what we're really doing here is we're taking you know, a many body wave function. We're creating an interesting many body state in these lattices. And once we take the photo, once we do the detection event, we project, let's say, this complex superposition state that we have onto one spatial configuration that we're actually seeing in the experiment then. And this would be, let's say, a photo that you see in a single snapshot. Maybe the wave function collapses onto this configuration, then this will be the configuration you see in the experiment in this particular run of the experiment. So now that's destructive, then you have to recreate Psi again and then do another measurement. Maybe then you see another configuration. And you do this thousands of times in your experiment. 
And then in the end of the day, what you get is a probability distribution of configuration. So you know how likely was it to have this configuration, that configuration, or the other configuration. And from these probabilities of configurations, I'll show you we can then calculate correlation functions that tell us something about the interesting physics that's going on in the system. At the end of the talk, I'll also tell you about, you know, you might wonder what are, why is he not writing out the complex coefficients here, the C coefficients, don't they play a role too? That's of course true. And right now, uh, if you just do a population measurement, you're only measuring the norm C squared, so the probabilities of being in that configuration. We would also like to know about the phases, and that's something we can do when we measure, for example, currents in the system, and I'll come back to that maybe at, at the end of my talk, where I'll give you an outlook how that, that also works. All right. So, Emmanuel, um, yeah. I think you very well, you very well anticipated one of the questions, which is exactly about the phases. So, sure. Back to that. The other question was: um, it's, you had this Dublon on your slide. Uh, maybe if you just tell us a little yeah. bit about that. What that is? So, the Dublon is just means you have. You remember in electrons? Think of electrons. You have a spin up electron and a spin down electron. And on a lattice, oh, sorry, my FaceTime is <laughs> recognizing my gestures. And so if you have two uh, spin up and a spin down on, on a lattice side, that's what we call a doublon. So you can put, right, uh, by Pauli principle, you cannot put two spin ups on one side. That's blocked by Pauli principle. But you can put on a single lattice side in a material, you can put a spin up and a spin down a particle. Right. So in this case, that's a that's a feature, not a because you know in the pictures on the left, it kind of looks like the the lattice in the image has morphed and deformed a little bit. So that this is in this case a, a desired feature, not a artifact. Yeah. So we 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 the doublons are not an artifact. They occur in the system. They are part of the physics, and we want to detect them. Right. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, so here's uh, some more pictures of how these look. Uh, for example, when we are dealing with so-called mod insulators, so these are strongly interacting, in this case, bosons or fermions would look the same, where they basically sort themselves out to, let's say, single atoms per site. So these are not arrays that have been sorted by us. So just nature does it for us. The physics of the strongly interacting repulsive particles does not want to have two particles sitting together and then they basically separate from each other and you can see very nicely they do this in a quite rather homogeneous way. There are some defects. These defects could be part of the physics that you're studying. So it could be quantum fluctuations in the system that generate this or they could be finite temperature effects, you know, the phase you have. There could be finite temperature defects that you have in that system. And typically, this is a picture, you know, we're dealing with systems of uh, up to two to 5,000 atoms that we can study in this way. All right, so let me turn to one uh, physics problem that I think is the reference problem the, for material science. You know, we in, in our quantum computer simulators, we always say we want to study material physics, material science. And I think the reference problem in that context is the so-called Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, where you basically just have uh, electrons, spin up, down electrons on a lattice. The electrons can tunnel from one side to the next. And then when they come together on one side, a spin up and a down electron, they can interact and they uh, interact very strongly and give rise to this repulsion U. So this is, can be expressed in this Hamiltonian. The first one just describes the tunnel, tunnel coupling. The second term describes the interaction part of your system. And that's what you want to study. And, you know, we're also interested in this simple Hamiltonian because even, you know, uh, you know, 40, 50 years after its introduction, we're still not entirely sure what the phase diagram of this Hamiltonian is, but we believe there are some deep connections to high TC superconductivity here. Uh, now, there's a special case when you have exactly 50% spin ups and spin downs in this model and you have strong repulsion then this uh, Fermi-Hubbard model maps onto actually a Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So you get a spin Hamiltonian with antiferromagnetic spin couplings. So the system will want to order antiferromagnetically. And then if we go to the real materials, if we take a look you know, uh, on a phase diagram of these high TC compounds, you, you typically find this interesting zoo of, uh, of phases, which people are trying to make sense of, where you have the undoped situation here to the left, and that's the situation I just described. There you have fine antiferromagnetic order in the system. And as soon as you start to dope the system, you start to see that all these uh, gazoo of phases break loose. There's this uh, D-wave superconducting phase here. There's this very mysterious pseudo-gap phase here that people are really puzzled by what this is. 
And if you want to express, you know, what is the simple question we're trying to answer here? What is the physics we're trying to study? It's basically how do holes, simple dopants, when you take out an electron, you inject basically a hole into the system. How do holes that move around in this antiferromagnetic environment, how do they compete with this tendency of the system to form antiferromagnetic order? So that's from a physics point of view, the difficult question that you want to answer. Well, the question sounds simple, but turns out it's actually very, very intricate and, and difficult. And there, of course, it's nice that if we can build such an artificial model system in our quantum simulation approach, then we can just directly look into the system and really take photos and see what each of the individual electrons is doing. So here I'm actually showing you a picture of how this looks in the experiment. So we have a physics region where here a flat region where we do the physics, where the lattice is. We have a reservoir connected to that, which we just use for cooling. And then we take those images that I showed you before. And then I can, for example, measure the average density of my particles in the system. If I can look also at the fluctuation, the particle number fluctuations on a site, or I can look at the, if I do the spin resolve, the detection, I can measure spin-spin correlations in the system. So I can measure how is the Z component on the spin on this side correlated with the Z component of the spin on that side. And you can see, you know, for the temperatures we reach, we can really see this very beautiful uh, antiferromagnetic order appear in the system. So we are at low enough temperatures where the system has uh, antiferromagnetically ordered over large parts of the system, over a few hundred lattice sites in the system. And just to, you know, check how good is the simulator uh, with, uh, you know, we can check against numerical methods. And so we can turn to people like Lode Poly here in Munich, who are, uh, experts on quantum Monte Carlo simulations, and we can compare this spin-spin correlation function due to numerics, which is this line here, which agrees perfectly with what we measure. So in this regime, in this undoped regime, quantum Monte Carlo works perfectly, and it serves as a good reference point. But as soon as we start to dope the system, quantum Monte Carlo, for example, will break down to work efficiently anymore, and we, you know, we can really go to the full advantage of, of the approach. So let me show you the physics, you know, uh, what happens when you put a hole into this uh, antiferromagnet. And, and so imagine you have this antiferromagnetically ordered system and you put a single hole in here and holes in quantum mechanics never want to stay in place. So in order for them to minimize their kinetic energy, they always want to move. They want to delocalize. But if they move around and you can see that immediately, if this hole moves to this side, the green atom, the spin down maybe has to move here. So this configuration emerges. And if then the hole moves another side, then actually the red atom has to move in here. And you see that the more the hole moves, the more like flip string of spins it leaves behind. But these string of spins are now ferromagnetically aligned, aligned parallel to each other, but that's not favored by the model. The model, remember, wants antiferromagnetic ordering, but when the hole moves, it creates this energy penalty it destroys this antiferromagnetic order and leaves a strong energy penalty behind, which means basically that this hole cannot move indefinitely because, uh, because of this uh, flipped spin strings of spins it leaves behind. And the more it moves, actually, the, the bigger the energy cost becomes. This energy cost increases linear with movement of the hole. And you can think of these flipped spins and the hole as basically being connected by a string and the energy of this string grows linearly with separation of these um, spins, these flipped spins and the hole that you have. And that's actually very similar if you, that we, what we know in physics that what occurs in nuclear physics, that's exactly the effect of confinement that gives rise to mesons, uh, for example, in, in, in high energy physics, our elementary particles. So we expect the same thing to happen here, a new elementary particle to occur in our electron cloud. And indeed, what we see, what happens here is indeed a new quasi-particle forming. And this is what we call the magnetic polaron, which is basically this hole surrounded by a distorted cloud of spin correlations, uh, which, uh, which, which arises due to the motion of this hole in this antiferromagnet. So that's the new particle. And whenever this hole moves, it always has to drag around with it this, this drag, this spin flip cloud uh, together moving with it. And that's what we call the magnetic polaron in the system. So here I show you some very nice data, some very recent data, you know, that one wants to calculate. Uh, you know, you could want to do that on an IBM quantum computer. We do it on our quantum simulator. This is how the spin environment around this hole actually looks like. 
So uh, let me show you what I'm plotting here. So let's say we center a hole here on this side or a Dublin, it doesn't matter for this experiment we're doing. And we're asking how are the spins uh, changed compared to the background when you find a hole here. So we can plot the spin-spin correlator, which is indicated by this ellipse here, uh, and ask how is the spin-spin correlator modified depending on finding a hole here in the center of the system. So your reference frame is now this moving hole. You look always focus on the hole and you ask how are the spin correlations modified. And here's the so-called connected correlation function that we measured in the quantum simulator that gives us a very quantitative prediction of this dressing cloud of this flipped string of spins that surround this atom moving around in the system. So that's a very nice result that you can really now try to compare to numerical methods. It's very hard actually to calculate. And there's actually a very recent nice experiment also from my colleagues uh, in, in Harvard and Princeton. I just showed the uh, results here from Princeton, from Vasim Bakker's group, how this works on a triangular lattice. There, there's a different kind of physics at hand. Frustration is at hand and kinetic induced polarons form. But again, you can also see the distortion of the spin cloud surrounding this impurity moving around in the lattice. To the questions, Latko? Uh, yes, maybe a quick question from uh, Bektor, and I'm not sure maybe you have this somewhere on your slides, but there was a question of um, what the correlation decay rate was like, if it was a power law or an exponential. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So it's not, uh, so I think for our case, we can't, uh, it's not so clear. We have to analyze this data. This is brand new data. So we didn't analyze for this. <laughs> so it's a very interesting question. So the size of this Polaron is, uh, depends on the um, it, basically on the ratio of kinetic energy of the dopant relative to the magnetic exchange energy of your electrons in the system. But and uh, that should scale like the size of this Polaron cloud, this dressing cloud should depend strongly on that. And that will be something very interesting to look at. Great. And um, uh, I see. And then maybe there was a question. Why is there a three point correlator? Ah. Why is this a yeah, good question? So remember what I'm, what I'm showing here, indeed, that's very important, is a quantity that you cannot measure in condensed matter physics. So condensed matter physicists in the experiment can only measure uh, two-point correlation functions. And that would not allow you to show this. So this is really a big advantage of our quantum systems that we have at hand, that we can analyze this. Why do we want to know this? Uh, what this three-point correlator tells me, it tells me how are these spins on site R plus I and R plus J correlated, conditioned on having a hole at site R? And that's precisely what I'm plotting here. So there's a hole on site R, and I'm asking then how are these spins uh, correlated, but I'm always conditioning it on having a hole in the center. So we're really looking at how the spins are distorted around this hole around this mobile dopant that's in the system. So that's very important. So it's really a unique correlator, three-point correlator that really um, highlights the features or directly allows us to visualize this Polaron cloud. Excellent. This, that's very, very nice. Thank you, Bector. Hopefully that addresses your question. Um, there was also a question around a link to this paper. Uh, yeah, there is a link, so you can just uh, look. There's this paper up here. You can uh, check it out. The latest data is not this one is not yet published, but we'll hopefully get it out soon. And actually, what we plan to do that's maybe important for the theorists. We're planning. We took a lot of data on these things, and uh, we're going to make them available as uh, on uh, Edmund or Simondo, one of the open repositories, so everybody can go in and use it, this data and compare your calculation to that, or you can compare your IBM quantum computation to that. So, you know, that, that that's good because we can start to compare the different platforms. So we're going to make this data available publicly. Excellent. Thank you, Emmanuel. This is really nice. And uh, I see a lot of comments in the chat. So hopefully we get most of them, folks. But it seems like it's already generating a lot of excitement. Good. Great. Great to see that. Um, OK, so let me uh, move on. We can, the nice thing, the quantum simulator is we can also, of course, continuously, you know, change the doping and uh, not without now explaining the physics of what's going on here. This is in this phase diagram of the cuprates. This is really going from this uh, regime where we have a strange metal phase back to a standard Fermi liquid, basically to a standard metal. If you don't know what these terms are, so we have a strange metal phase over here, Fermi liquid, and we can really microscopically resolve for the first time what's happening in these systems, you know, um, atom by atom uh, through these multi-point correlation functions. 
All right. Another example I want to show you, uh, you know, which I found quite exciting is we want to learn something from these systems, right? In the end, we would like to predict, can we have materials with higher TC, uh, higher critical temperature uh, in the superconductors? And uh, for that, we first need to understand where actually does, for example, binding of two holes come from. And when you think of that, what happens, two holes bind together, they form something like a Cooper pair. This can undergo condensation and then form the superconducting phase. So the first thing we're looking for is, you know, binding of holes together to form new entities. And how can we have make that happen at very high energy scales, at very high temperatures, such that we could get, you know, high TC compounds in the system. Uh, and for that, let's just look at this very simple model system to understand what actually determines the critical temperature or the binding energy of pairs. Why do holes even bind together at all? Because everything in this Hubbard model is actually repulsive. So how come there can be an attraction between two holes? And this is something we can visualize very nicely in this picture. Imagine you have what we call a rung a ladder system. So we have just uh, one rung of the ladder here, another rung of the ladder here. Uh, so, um, and then we have very strong um, antiferromagnetic couplings along the rung. So they want to form spin singlets. So you have a spin up down minus spin down up uh, on these bonds here. And then we put two holes in here. And now imagine one of the holes starts moving on the rung of the ladder and it will move here. And if it moves, you'll see actually, oh, it breaks the uh, antiferromagnetic couplings on the vertical lines, and that will cost us energy. So that's not good. That will be an energy penalty. But now you see if the upper hole follows in pursuit, if it also comes to the same new run position again, then it undoes the damage the first hole does and basically has restored the original configuration. So there's no energy difference between this configuration and that one. And that means basically that these two hole pairs will favor, will want to be bound together simply because of the magnetic correlations that are in the system. So that's the important thing to understand. Magnetic correlations drive the binding of the whole pairs to each other in this system. Now, there's one thing we're missing in this picture is that from a kinetic energy point of view, this is not so good because a hole cannot delocalize to the other side, so it cannot gain kinetic energy. So from that point of view, it's actually not very favorable to do that. And uh, they actually, there's a repulsion because of the kinetic energy term. Turns out that overall still binding wins, but there's a very weak binding energy between those pairs, meaning in the end, this leads to a very low condensation temperature, for example. And the question was, you know, how can we get rid of that? And uh, one way that we, you know, then proposed together with our theory colleagues, uh, Fabian Gust and Annabel Bort, was that, you know, if you can remove this kinetic energy penalty, then you could simply boost, dramatically boost the binding energy of the pairs. And the trick to then uh, get rid of this kinetic energy penalty was to go to a mixed dimensional configuration where we just prohibit the atoms from, or the electrons from tunneling across the rungs of the system. So there's no energy penalty anymore, but the spin-spin interaction still occurs across these rungs and across this direction also along the rungs. And if you do that, then you can dramatically boost the binding energy. You just remain with this binding because of the magnetic energy correlations in the system. And if you look here at this plot, this is a measurement now of the whole hole correlation function of trying to see how likely is it that we find two holes on really neighboring sites on a rung if we have the normal situation, we actually we see the holes never want to sit close to each other. But once we go to this mixed dimensional configuration, we see this strong uh, positive correlation signal, which tells us there's now a new hole binding in the system. And actually, the binding energy of those holes has been boosted by a factor of 50. So I was excited about this because, you know, people said first, well, this seems like a very artificial configuration. But it turns out, you know, we were able to also extend this to, to two dimensions. So now we start to see how these holes start to cluster together for form bigger structures, something that we call stripe structures in the physics of high TC compounds. And in fact, they were actually identified to play a major role. This mixed dimensional geometry was found to play a major role in a new high TC compound that was discovered actually also this year in April of this year uh, with a high uh, temperature, high TC temperature of, of 80 Kelvin. And what the theorists found is actually that what we have been predicting, you know, in this with the cold atom setup, that this mixed dimension should lead to this uh, jump or this increase in the critical temperature was actually found to be present in this so-called nickelate compounds, where the 
electrons, the holes, for example, can only move in the planes here, but not, cannot jump across the planes. So you have precisely the configuration I told you. And uh, I think that was you know, very exciting for us to see for a first time a prediction coming out of the coal atom community picked up uh, by, and learning something new about the new physics that's going on in these high TC materials and these new high TC materials. All right, just to finish off this, this part of the, the talk, I just want to you know, give credit to a fantastic work of uh, two of my colleagues. There are many more one should mention, but here uh, there's especially nice work in, in Martin Svierlein's group uh, at MIT, who's looking at the similar problems with attractively interacting uh, uh, fermions on his ladders. That is, and there's really nice work from uh, Harvard and Princeton group from Markus Kreiner and Vasim Bakker, where they are looking at you know frustrated geometries where they tune the lattice from a square lattice to a triangular lattice and can in a controllable way actually introduce frustration into the system and can learn something about how the spin correlation and dopants actually change in this system. All right, um, uh, just to give you on the big picture, you know, where are we now in this uh, mystery of, of high TC? I think we're entering this super interesting regime, uh, as I showed you before on the phase diagram, that people call the pseudo gap regime, where we're trying to learn about this very mysterious phase that people have not been able to understand. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, I hear when I hear the theorists, they see like there's an elephant in the room, but we can't see what the elephant is, you know. Uh, and the, and the thing, maybe the reason why we've not been able to see the elephant, meaning the real important physics that's going on, is because with the probes that we've had at hand in you know, real materials, we're just not able to grasp the complex correlations that are present in the system. And here, I think quantum computers and simulators can offer a unique way to access these higher order correlation functions, like the three-point correlator I showed you, that maybe will tell us more, will help us to unravel you know, what's really going on. In, in this pseudo gap regime that we have in the system. All right, um, that's what I wanted to tell about uh, strongly correlated electron physics. Slatko, maybe a good point if there are more questions on that part that people want to ask. Um, there were a few technical neat questions from Vector, but maybe in the interest of time here, why don't we leave those to the end so that we can get through some of the non equilibrium and come back? So Sounds bring good. those back up, folks, uh, when we're at the end. Sounds good. Let's do that. All right, so non-equilibrium physics, non-equilibrium dynamics, you know, I think if we're looking for quantum advantages, it's kind of the most straightforward regime or most straightforward experiments we can do on our systems uh, where we can achieve quantum advantage simply because we have double quantum advantage in space and time in these problems. And, uh, but of course, they're also challenging for experiments. Typically what you want to have is large system sizes you want homogeneous systems, you want to go for long evolution times to learn about what kind of nature of the transport, for example, you have in these systems. So it's also not an easy regime for experiment, one has to say, but it's, I think, the easiest one where we can really think about having advantages in, you know, doing some physics that we can't calculate on a, on a, on a classical computer. Now, one of the early things, you know, I think really that started this whole field of uh, quantum information science, marrying that with quantum physics, that was this very early work of Elliot Leap and uh, Robinson from 1972, who for the first time asked the question, how quickly does actually information spread in a many body system? And what they found is that in systems with short range interactions that are typical for material systems, there's kind of a linear light cone when you make a perturbation here, for example, at point A, at some time and you ask how quickly does that spread, there's like a linear uh, velocity spread of those correlations, giving you an upper bound, a maximum velocity at which information can spread. I think this was a very influential paper still today, you know, already foreseeing this marriage of quantum information with quantum physics. And uh, we could measure that actually for the first time in 2012 in our experiments, seeing, you know, when you make a perturbation to the system and you look at the correlations that propagate out in the system, you can indeed see this linear spreading of correlations in the system that was then in 2014 also later done in, in ion trap experiments. I think another you know, nice first uh, for the cold atom community is this nice work from Markus Kreiner that is connected to thermalization in quantum many body systems. You know, how the question of how do isolated quantum many body systems thermalize and how can we study that on our quantum machines? And uh, one powerful way of studying that is to measure the entanglement entropy in the system 
And one nice way that has been done in Marco's experiment was to use kind of many body interferometer, basically a Hongo Mandel interferometer experiment to measure this uh, Rene 2 entropy in the system, which is a proxy for the Van Neumann entropy that told us something about, you know, how does the system locally look? How does it approach local thermal equilibrium? while well, as a global system starting uh, staying pure over the entire evolution of the system. So that was, I think, very important insight into that. And then, of course, the beautiful experiments, you know, where you know, Slatko yourself, you're involved, where we're asking ourselves, you know, when does this fail? When do we not have this situation of um, thermalization? And this is, of course, here what happens in the concept of uh, many body localization. If we have interacting disordered quantum system and we let them evolve, are there situations where they will retain memory of the initial state, you know, for an infinite amount of time? I think the question is not fully settled whether this phase truly exists uh, uh, or whether you know we have to go to extremely long time scales. So it's still an open question, but I think we are making a lot of progress in the experiments also in starting to understand the time scales that are involved, the relaxation phenomena. And I should of course mention this nice work here from, from IBM where they try to measure these actually these L bits that occur in this dynamic, this localized. Um, orbitals were that play an important role in the physics of this many body localization. Another thing that you know I think was highly successfully studied is this anomalous spin transport. So let me explain that a little bit more in detail to you. So how can we do quantum transport atom by atom or qubit by qubit if you want in, in these systems? So imagine you have uh, you know setting up your system in an out of equilibrium configuration, let's say like this one, an atom, no atom, an atom, no atom. And then you let the system evolve due to some Hamiltonian in the system. And what you will then get in the end is maybe this configuration, or you know, if you uh, run the experiment again and measure again, you might find another configuration. So you're measuring all these different configurations in the experiment, and then you can you know, measure quantities, correlate densities on different sites, but you can also partition the system, look at a certain subsystem of your entire system, these gray boxes, and just ask, how many particles do I actually have in that box after this evolution time? And when you do that, when you repeat the experiment thousands of times, then you arrive at a distribution function telling you how often you found n number of particles in this box. And this is what we call the full counting statistics in your transport experiment. And that's something that we can readily access in, in, in the quantum devices we have at hand. And that's a very, very powerful way of studying quantum transport, learning about quantum transport by looking at this full uh, counting statistic that's directly accessible in the experiments. Um, so um, yeah, maybe I'll, in the light of time, I'll actually skip the details of this. We can maybe go into this in the question round. So I wanted to give you an example of this. I just want to give you maybe a simpler example that was actually connected to um, spin transport in one dimensional systems where we're trying to set up a one dimensional Heisenberg chain and we want to learn about spin transport, the nature of spin transport in the system. Uh, so we can set up, for example, uh, like a domain wall that you can see here, all the spins up here, all the spins down on the right hand side at time zero, and then we let this domain wall, magnetic domain wall, evolve as a function of time. And you can see how atom by atom, they're propagating from one side of the domain wall into the other one. And then by repeating the experiment thousands of times, we can measure again the full counting statistics of this experiment. Now, why was this experiment for the Heisenberg model? Because people had been predicting there's a new form of quantum transport occurring in the system, a new port way of uh, a new universal law that maybe would be governed by what people call the so-called Carter parisi zhang equation. So this is actually an equation, a very famous um, equation from statistical physics that tells us something about the growth of um, you know, surface when you drop particles from uh, above onto a surface. And it tells us something about how does this surface grow as a function of time. And here you can see just a picture uh, of, of how this would look like in, in, in an experiment. 
It's governed by this nonlinear stochastic partial differential equation. And people actually conjectured that this such a nonlinear uh, partial differential equation could maybe also describe the spin transport occurring in our Heisenberg transport, uh, Heisenberg experiments. You know, that's really what we strive for in physics. We want to find universal laws. We, of course, can calculate the full Hamiltonian evolution. But at the end of the day, as a physicist, I want to find a simple formula, I want to find you know, universal concepts that underlie all this quantum transport. So being able to find that or being able to identify new universality classes of this transport would actually be a very big thing, a very nice thing to do that. So that motivated us to study that uh, and, and really measure this full counting statistics in the experiment. And actually, we found that actually it looks like there's indeed this Kada parisi zhang universality class at the bottom of this, a new universality class, very special than the only new, basically, from classical physics that governs the spin transport in these systems. Then actually, Google did also the experiment. Also this year, there was a very nice paper from the Google team doing precisely the same thing on the Sycamore uh, quantum processor, setting up this domain wall that you can see here, and then just you know checking how do the spins move over uh, from the domain wall into the other part of the magnetic uh, magnetized region and then also measuring the uh, distribution functions. And they could go to um, measure this a little bit more precise than we could, not to as long times as we could, but they showed that, well, it looks like maybe there's even a new universality class that we hadn't heard about before in this system. So I think, you know, this just shows you by having these powerful tools at hand of measuring the full counting statistics, we can really access quantum transport in completely new ways on these devices. And I think that's a very beautiful and powerful way uh, to study these phenomena. All right, in my last uh, few minutes, I just want to, you know, give us an outlook where, where can we head next. And, you know, we have the digital quantum computers, the circuit model. We have the analog systems that I told you about before. And we also, I told you that, you know, I think each one of them has, depending on your problem, advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, maybe for the future, marrying those both worlds will be, be interesting to get the both of best of both. So having an analog operation which can take you far out on your NISC devices, then having digital readout or digital preparation to measure kind of very complex systems. And if we want to do that in our systems where we have dealing with moving particles, where we have orbital degrees of freedom, we really have to think of a new block sphere that I would just like to make, make you aware of that we want to measure and that we can measure now in the experiment. So you're all aware of the block sphere in, in, in spins. But here's a little bit different. So imagine we have our lattice system that you have here. And we want to now not only measure the occupation of the different lattice sites, but I also want to measure uh, some things like the kinetic energy or the currents that are flowing between one site and the next site here. How can I do that? And how can I think of that in terms of a, um, a block sphere that I have? So the way we think of this is that you know if this is the physical system, we can, for measurement purposes, petition it into an array of double wells that you can see here. And uh, this array of double wells is now like a block sphere, where you can basically do sigma x rotations. You have a you know, particle being on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side. These are like the uh, 0 and 1 of your qubit. And you can have tunneling from left to right that corresponds to sigma x rotation. Or if you, you know, detune the uh, double well, in your orbital degrees of freedom, then you basically are making a sigma z rotation of your of your of your orbital qubit. So we can think now of this this block sphere picture of the orbital degrees of freedom that we have at hand, where the z axis that would be basically just corresponding to density measurements that I told you before. The x axis would be measuring the kinetic energy in the system, and the y axis would be corresponding to the current operator of the current flowing between two lattice sites in the system. And we can move around on this block sphere, and by doing suitable rotations on the block sphere, we can measure either of these quantities. And this is, of course, very nice, because then we can not only measure occupations, but we can also measure currents or kinetic energies directly in our uh, quantum simulator. And that uh, gives us access to these phase factors that I alluded to before that are present in the many-body wave function. Just to show you an example of this, uh, we can, for example, create a situation where we have currents flowing here between these sites and opposite currents flowing in uh, the opposite sites here. And we can measure that in the experiment. 
using this readout scheme, using these double wells that I showed you before. And here's a measurement of these currents, uh, allowing us also to measure, for example, current current correlators and things like that. And you see this very good agreement with theory. And uh, this, I think, is a significant enhancement for us that allows us to measure now all quantities of this Hamiltonian in the experiments and even higher order correlation functions in this. So in looking a little bit ahead, you know, there's been exciting developments in the field. You've heard about the fantastic work uh, of the tweezer arrays in, for example, Misha Lukin's group. And I think there's this very nice work from Adam Kaufman and Boulder, who's marrying the optical lattices with the optical tweezers. And I think that's going to be a very powerful approach because the lattices offer a pristine storage environment and the tweezers offer the ability of shuttling these around. And then there's the uh, enticing possibility to also put completely new particles into these lattices and do like really small chemical reactions between individual atoms to form molecules out of them. These molecules can have, you know, long range dipole, dipole electric interaction. So this is something, you know, uh, for a physicist, uh, a fantastic playground to work on. So to study with, you know, absolute quantum control, also these, these chemical reactions in the system. So just on, the, on this middle part, let me show you a little bit of finally our progress we're doing here in Munich. Here's a picture of a lattice loaded, a very large lattice. Each individual point here is a single atom. So there are over 10,000 atoms now loaded, individual atoms loaded into this register, into this lattice. And, you know, we are now trying to marry this with the tweezers where we can move atoms around now in the lattices and showing we can, you know, hopefully marriage these large scale uh, storage devices where we really have a large amount of qubits or atoms in the system. And we can combine that with the beautiful physics of the tweezers where we can move these things around. And that, you know, is, of course, very exciting for the future to, to be able to develop these techniques. Okay, finally, you know, let me just, you know, for the last few minutes, let me just give really credit to the people in the lab who have been uh, doing the work. Uh, and so there's been a fantastic team of PhD postdocs and group leaders on that. So on our rubidium quantum gas microscope experiment, Johannes Zayas is leading that, and David Wade did the fantastic work on the KPZ experiment here. And uh, on the fermion experiment I showed you before, and uh, most of the work on the Polaron was actually done by uh, Janis Köpsel, that was his PhD work and uh, the newest data actually on the large Polaron that you've seen that we're going to publish hopefully soon that that's work here of this new team of students Thomas C and Peter are working on that experiment. Um, yeah the CSIM experiment also showed some some data from on the orbital kind of degrees of freedom that's uh, work I'm doing together with my colleague Monica Eidelsburger here in Munich and that was mainly work by Alex and Pertwo showing you this new Bloch sphere for orbital degrees of freedom uh, that we are working together with. All right, uh, Slatko, I'm at the end of the talk. I leave you with this nice picture from Munich and uh, thanks a lot for all your interest. Thank you, Emmanuel. I think we're all waiting to visit now, given this beautiful picture. There were a lot of questions and many of them are, I'm going to have a hard time getting back to exactly on what slide they were because they were a little uh, pointed so uh, to a specific uh, piece of them. So folks, help me out by reposting your top heated questions that we want to get to. Uh, by the way, folks are already saying amazing talk. Great job. We really enjoyed it. Um, so maybe that's uh, th this is really wonderful. Uh, one of the very first questions that we skipped over, and, and you sort of alluded to it or touched on it, is just a better understanding of some of the main advantages and challenges for ion-based systems and these kinds of systems. And now it's incredibly interesting, of course, that you know lattices are merging now with the tweezers, yes. so in a new direction. But maybe if you give you know folks who are not from these three communities a bit of an overview of how to think about the three. Okay, so we have, I would say the, uh, the lattice and the tweezers, they're very naturally connected. That, that's very close to each other. We're dealing both with neutral atoms. They're both trapped by light fields, either by a focused laser beam, that's the tweezer, uh, or by a lattice, which is the structures I told you about. And you can easily connect them, combine them. And that's very natural. Uh, it's, uh, you're just using them for different purposes. One, the lattices are more, you know, purposeful, I think, for if you want to do, let's say, directly material simulations, if you directly want to do a quantum simulation of your material in a certain lattice structure, the lattices are a very interesting way to go. They're also, in a sense, can allow very large structure sizes. If you think about 3D, we can even think about going to million atoms in three dimensions. So scaling that to 3D 
uh, it's, it has a lot of potential there. So, and they can act, for example, the lattices could also be good storage uh, registers where you store qubits or atoms and then move them around with the tweezers. So that could be a very nice combination of the two. The ions, again, completely different platform. We're dealing, uh, you know, charged uh, atoms. We've removed one electron, so they're positively charged. They are trapped in electromagnetic traps, uh, typically uh, Powell traps. These are typically one-dimensional geometries. Uh, where you're basically most of the time uh, dealing with about uh, 50 ions in this such a one-dimensional geometry okay you can also have nice i think racetracks like continuum what they're doing uh, so that's a little bit the difference there i would say what's really nice with the neutral atom platform is that it scales very nicely as you've seen there's very easy to scale this platform i think the ion trap is a bit harder as i you know will We'll see uh, a lot of interesting concepts around, but to scale might be harder there. At what point, and this is a question that comes up often in discussions, at what point do you run out of laser power for, for these systems? Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> you can, that's a good question. We always want a powerful laser, uh, as we so we have a lot of powerful lasers in the lab. Uh, that be, can become a limit and will become a limit, I think, but not on this 10,000 side scale yet. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff to be done on a 10,000 site scale. So if we want to go to 100,000 or a million, then I think we might have to go to 3D. Then I think we'll have a, you know, you will run, going to run into the problems that you mentioned. But on the other hand, it might be just a technical problem. You know, a laser, I mean, we have kilowatts, 10 of kilowatts lasers around. We're just using the 100 watt version, which is dangerous enough, you know, but, um, but yeah, I think that might require some more engineering, but it's not completely out of the question. Or we could use cavities to enhance the light fields to make them stronger. So there are a lot of, but I think until this range of 10,000 qubits, there's not a problem. Okay, excellent. Um, speaking of numbers, there was a question from Kaylin around what, what are the largest lattices that uh, you have manipulated to date? Yeah, so um, on the Hubbard model systems, I think there were um, about uh, three, 4,000 atom systems uh, this one that i showed you here and this picture this one picture where is it uh, this one is like over tens of thousands of particles in this lattice great so that's the largest one we've imaged and we're also manipulating atoms with the tweezers in this lattice now <laughs> excellent on this picture um can you remind us what this ring is on the outside Ah, that's a technical artifact. The lattice is actually much bigger, but the cooling, the laser cooling that we need only works uh, efficient in this region. And there's a region where the laser cooling breaks down. And this is exactly the white ring you're seeing. Then it starts to work again on the outer ring. But uh, yeah, that's limiting the, the, the size of the system at the moment. So the actual lattice is even larger than what you can see here on this picture. But that's the usable size that we can use in the experiment. Okay, excellent. Um, and you you mentioned um, you mentioned quantum advantage, and you know as you create more and more, this you ideally you would do this in a system where you have a lot of qubits. You also have increasingly, presumably, entangled two D or higher states, so that classical computers are not in a position of, of their forte. Then um, what also happens is, of course, you get this operator spreading, which also means your more your lattice is more and more susceptible to noise that it already has. Um, so while you can maybe create these more entangled states, they're also more susceptible to noise. Is there is there some sort of interesting trade-off there that we should think about, or is there a, is there potentially a limit there, or is that probably not a main issue? Maybe you can tell us just a little more about what you're thinking about. Well, that that for sure is an issue. I mean, that for sure is an issue. Uh, I think it depends on what the quantities you're looking at. Uh, you know, that could lead, for example, this. What we've been talking about, you know, for a long time, evolutions in an MBL system that could eventually lead to a small relaxation. So small shaking of our lasers, uh, lattice structures that could lead to a small relaxation. And it will, you know, it will. The question is, you know, is still the physics you're looking at, is it still dominated by the interesting physics you're interested in? And uh, that's not always so easy to answer about answer, because can you be sure that it's, you know, the physics intrinsically to the physics, this relaxation, or is it, you know, due to your laser noise that you're studying? So you have to check then, do several checks on your system and check the dependencies on parameters. So it's not a, it's a good, very good question. And but I don't have a straightforward answer to that. And it's certainly correct what the, what the question was asked. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. And um, maybe 
two more questions here from Bector. One of them was about the KPZ equation, whether it's mm -hmm. Markovian or has a memory effect to it. Uh, so, so it, so what we study here in the KPZ equation. So we just we we start with the initial the initial conditions determine in this KPZ equation the initial configuration that you have will determine what the fluctuations, for example, in the distribution in the end are going to be. So those initial conditions do determine what kind of fluctuations you can see in the end, right? And that's the question if that's also true for the quantum system. This is known for the KPZ equation uh, for coming from classical statistical physics. And that's precisely the question we would like to learn about. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then uh, maybe final question here from the audience. I suppose it's a great time to post final questions. We get to the end here. Um, I think you showed us that you can measure uh, entanglement entropy. Uh, maybe you can remind us how how uh, that was performed. Uh, is it possible to measure measure an entanglement spectrum? Yes. So uh, entanglement spectrum is also possible. That was recently done, but that was done more in the ion trap, not in the neutral atom community. So far, there has been a nice work in the ion ion trap community just very recently. So this uh, von Neumann entropy or the Rennie two entropy actually was measured with uh, basically a many-body Hongu Mandel experiment. You, I guess a lot of you will be familiar with the Hongu Mandel experiments for two photons on a beam splitter. And what you can show is if you do that, like uh, this is like uh, you copy, you have to initialize your system in two identical copies. And then you basically do such a many body quantum interference, like a Hongu Mandel beam splitter, and then you read out. And from reading out this uh, many body interference, you can actually reconstruct the Rini 2 entropy and the purity of the state that you have. So that's I without going too much into the detail. So here are some references if you are interested in that. That that was what this is done. But I, I like this particularly this experiment because it's so close to this analog of the you know um, Hongu Mandel experiment in quantum optics that we all love and understand very well. Excellent, great. Uh, well, I think with that, folks, I'd like to thank you all for the wonderful questions you've had, and and I think there there was quite a large audience. I don't remember the numbers, over 80, 80 100 folks today concurrence. So what a great way to um, show up for episode one hundred forty eight, the last one of this year. We'll be back next year, Emmanuel. Uh, I think this is a great time maybe to give the stage to you if you want to share any final words with us. Well, just it was a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitations, Latko, and thanks to all of you for being here and asking such good questions. I think, you know, the end of year coming up, happy holiday season, take some time off, relax, and uh, fresh energy to new quantum excitement in the new year. Thanks a lot. All right. And I will echo that. Uh, so from Emmanuel, myself, Paul, and the IBM Quantum team, Happy holidays. I hope you've enjoyed 148 of uh, these seminars. Uh, stay warm and we look forward to exciting new chapters in 2024, every Friday at noon Eastern time on the IBM Kiskit Quantum Seminar. So with that, have a great new year.